For thousands of years, dungeons have been used not just to punish, but to break a prisoner's very spirit. These chambers of torment specially designed to maximize fear and suffering. Confined alone in the dark with no hope of release, and with the full knowledge that their fate was now in the hands of an uncaring jailer, prisoners would often be driven to insanity, the remainder of their short lives spent in madness and despair. Here are my choices for five of the worst dungeons in history. Number 5. The Bug Pits of Zindon Prison Condemned to languish for years in one of the most notorious dungeons in Central Asia, two British diplomats became the playthings of a cruel and despotic tyrant as they were abandoned by their own government and reduced to expendable pawns in a grand geopolitical game between two of the most powerful empires on the planet. Known as the Great Game, the 19th century rivalry between the British and Russian empires would see the two superpowers compete for influence and control over vast swathes of Central Asia. The lands of Afghanistan, Persia and Tibet stood as a strategic but highly contested buffer between Russia and British-controlled India. Britain feared Russia's rapid expansion south through Central Asia, believing that it was only a matter of time until the Tsars threatened British interests in India, while Russia was equally suspicious of British trade and military advances into Central Asia. Both sides were prepared to do everything in their power to protect their strategic interests. Bukhara in modern-day Uzbekistan would find itself at the centre of this great game in 1838, when a British diplomat was dispatched from India on an important diplomatic mission to this ancient Silk Road city. Colonel Charles Stoddart was tasked with persuading Emir Nasrullah Khan to enter into an alliance with the British Empire, thus keeping Russian ambitions in the region in check. However, the colonel almost immediately alienated the ruler he intended to sway. Ignorant of local customs, upon arrival Stoddart offended his host by riding his horse right up to the emir and saluting from the saddle, despite royal protocol demanding that visiting dignitaries first dismount and approach the emir on foot. Further salt was added to this diplomatic wound by Stoddart failing to arrive bearing tribute and gifts. Angered and insulted by his British guest's behaviour, the emir threw Stoddart into the infamous Bug Pit, the worst dungeon at the dreaded Zindan prison, and one which was reserved for those deserving of the most severe punishment. Adjacent to the usual torture chambers and shackle-laden cells one might expect from a dungeon, the fourth cell, also known as the Bug Pit, was a 40-foot deep hole in the ground, accessible only by rope. With no lighting, ventilation or sanitation, this dark chasm deep within the bowels of the dungeon provided prisoners with virtually no space to move or even lay down, while the stagnant air filling their lungs was tainted by the foul smell of their own waste, which congealed upon the cold and hard stone floor, continually building up unchecked over the months and years of their stay. Yet as if these horrific conditions were not punishment enough, the dungeon's guards are said to have taken great pleasure in regularly pouring buckets of vermin and bugs into the pit, the rats, scorpions, lice and other biting insects raining upon their heads, further tormenting prisoners past the point of madness. Shut off from daylight and the outside world, the men wallowed in their own filth indefinitely, their sentence lasting for as long as it pleased the emir denied even the faint hope of a future release date. Deprived of sleep, hygiene and even basic human dignity, those emaciated prisoners lucky enough to be dragged out of the pit still alive upon release would be covered with sores and lice, however the vast majority of prisoners condemned to the bug pit would never see the sun again. Colonel Charles Stoddart languished in these conditions for months, until finally a second British intelligence officer was dispatched with orders to secure his release. Captain Arthur Connolly arrived in Bukhara in late 1841, intent on freeing the incarcerated colonel. However, this second mission would meet a similar disastrous fate as the first. Once again, the emir was offended after Captain Connolly failed to arrive bearing a letter from Queen Victoria herself, believing the dispatch of a mere captain to be a thinly veiled insult. Enraged by this perceived slight, 
the Emir charged Captain Colony with espionage and threw him into the bug pit with Stoddart, where the pair would languish for months together until the Emir finally ran out of patience. Believing the British to be weak following their recent defeat in Afghanistan and loss of an entire 16,000 strong army, the emboldened Emir Nasrullah Khan no longer feared British retaliation for his actions, and on the 24th of June 1842, he had the men publicly executed. The barely breathing husks of men were dragged from the bug pit and ordered to dig their own graves before having their heads cut off in front of a baying crowd. This grim fate finally bringing to end years of suffering in the underground hell, now known to history as the bug pits of Zindon Prison. Number 4. Colonel Bailey's Dungeon Exhausted, bloodied, and beaten in battle despite a heroic last stand, a British East India Company colonel and the handful of still living men under his command may have thought that the worst of their suffering was over. However, as these new prisoners of war were taken into captivity, they soon realised that their torment was only just beginning. The British East India Company found itself at war with the southern Indian Kingdom of Mysore after seizing the French-controlled port of Mahe in 1779. Although the port was ruled by the French, it was defended by Mysorean soldiers. The Mysorean ruler Haider Ali was already a key French ally in the region, however this humiliating seizure of a port which was supposed to be under his protection proved to be the final straw for Haider Ali. The Second Anglo-Mysore War had begun. Haider Ali intended to drive the British out of southern India, and was able to win a string of victories against British East India Company forces, however perhaps his greatest victory of the war would be at the Battle of Polilur. The Mysorean ruler dispatched 10,000 soldiers under the command of his eldest son, Tipu Sultan, with orders to intercept and destroy a British relief force that was moving to break Indian sieges of several key East India Company forts. The company army of around 4,000 men under the command of Colonel William Bailey would never reach their intended destination. On the morning of September the 10th, 1780, Tipu Sultan caught the British force in a well-executed pincer attack, surrounding and routing the British, despite Colonel Bailey leading a small detachment of his men in a disciplined and heroic last stand. The 4,000 strong British force had been almost completely wiped out in what was the worst defeat the East India Company had suffered on the subcontinent at the time, with 2,000 killed and a further 1,000 captured. Colonel Bailey and a small number of surviving European officers were captured and taken to the Mysore capital, where the infamous dungeon that would later be named after Colonel Bailey awaited its new guests. Measuring 100 feet by 40 feet, jutting out of the white walls of the dungeon are several stone slabs positioned at shoulder height, to which prisoners are said to have been chained. However, the suffocating shackles were not intended to merely prevent prisoners from escaping. According to some accounts, the prisoners were stripped naked and chained to the stone slabs while immersed in cold water all the way up to their necks, forcing the men to stay on their feet or drown. With their heads barely above water, the prisoners were deprived of sleep for days at a time, as their weakened, aching legs buckled under the strain of standing up for so long. Pushed beyond exhaustion, it's no surprise that men perished under such inhumane conditions, with the most notable casualty of the water dungeon being Colonel Bailey himself, the captured British commander finally succumbing to its barbaric conditions after enduring an incredible two years in captivity. The surviving prisoners remained in the dungeon until 1784, when some four years after being captured in battle, they were finally freed with a handful of these eventually returning to the site of their incarceration to take revenge, when in May 1799, the fortress and Colonel Bailey's dungeon beneath finally fell to British forces. Number 3. The Oubliette Throughout history, those who displeased the authorities could expect to be met with swift and merciless retribution. However, the dreaded oubliette was unique in that it was purposely designed to inflict the maximum level of mental torment, a particularly cruel form of imprisonment that used the man's hope and yearning for freedom against him. 
This dark and damp, inescapable hole in the ground, driving its victims beyond the brink of insanity, in a chilling testament to the cruelty of the human imagination when it comes to dreaming up new ways of inflicting suffering on others. Also known as a bottle dungeon, the Nubliette was essentially a tiny prison cell dug deep beneath a castle, accessible only from a small locked hatch in the ceiling above. The unfortunate prisoner would be lowered on a rope by the guards into what would become his new home, and almost certainly his tomb. Once at the bottom, the rope would be pulled up and the trapdoor would be permanently closed and locked, this tiny window to the outside world laying agonisingly out of reach, just a few feet above. Too far to climb, but tantalisingly close enough to tease the prisoner and remind him of everything he had lost. Once you were thrown into the oubliette, you would almost certainly never get out. You simply cease to exist. In fact, even the name oubliette is derived from the French word oublier, which means to forget. Languishing alone in the darkness at the bottom of this cold and damp pit, a prisoner was essentially left to rot, forgotten by the outside world and even those who had imprisoned him. He was a ghost even before his physical form had finally succumbed to dehydration and starvation. The walls of the oubliette were made from smooth stone to prevent any possibility of climbing out, while the dimensions of the dungeon were often so narrow that it wasn't even wide enough for the prisoner to lay down or even sit. Forced to stand for the remainder of his life, the sleep-deprived prisoner would spend his time permanently staring at either the wall in front of his face or the small locked hatch above him, his dreams of making the impossible climb to freedom, pushing his sanity to the point of no return. The depth and suffocatingly tight dimensions of the cell, coupled with being cut off from the outside world, made escape all but impossible. The oubliette had been carefully designed to both torment its occupant and prevent any possibility of escape. Located in the secluded depths of a castle, even the prisoner's anguished screams and pleas for mercy would go unheard. He would likely never see another human face again. To make matters even worse, the cell lacked any sanitation, food or water, and what little space there was would also be occupied by rats, insects and other vermin, and in some cases even the bones of the cell's former occupants, as it's unlikely that the guards would have gone to the trouble of removing the corpse of the previous prisoner. Even without food and water, the slow process of dehydration could take several days to finally bring the prisoner's suffering to an end, this time spent doing nothing else other than contemplating the horrific situation he was in. In this dark, damp and claustrophobic pit, even the strongest mind would eventually break. Yet this terrifying fate could be made even worse with some lords punishing their prisoners further by providing them with just enough food and water to keep them alive, prolonging the victim's suffering for months or even years. Although the oubliette might seem unnecessarily cruel, they also served more practical purposes. A prolonged stay in an oubliette could force a confession out of even the most stubborn captive, and they also served as a convenient way to silently eliminate enemies and rivals, Instead of executing an enemy publicly, rivals could be discreetly disposed of in an oubliette, the victim mysteriously vanishing from public life without placing their blood on your hands and sullying your good name, avoiding any potential backlash from their relatives, friends or the common people. Although rare, oubliettes have been most famously discovered at Warwick Castle in England and Leap Castle in Ireland, the latter containing the bones of 150 skeletons at its base, along with a pocket watch from the 1800s, illustrating just how recently this medieval dungeon was still being used. Number 2. The Black Hole of Calcutta Herded at gunpoint into a tiny cell designed to hold just a couple of inmates, 146 British prisoners of war spent a sweltering summer night confined in hellish conditions that would leave just 23 of their number still alive come morning. Packed together so tightly that the guards are said to have struggled to close the door, as many as 123 captives suffocated to death in the heat or were crushed and trampled by other inmates as they desperately tried to catch a gasp of air from the tiny windows of a cell that became known as the Black Hole of Calcutta. 
By the time the British East India Company had established a foothold on the Indian subcontinent, the once mighty Mughal Empire was in terminal decline, with much of the emperor's power now resting in the hands of Nawabs, local provincial governors who increasingly fancied themselves as kings in their own right. One of these regional rulers was the ambitious Nawab of Bengal, Siraj Ud Daula, a man who resented and feared the growing British presence in his territory. The British East India Company had established a trading base in Calcutta in the 1690s, and they had constructed Fort William to defend their interests. However, by the mid 1700s, competition from the fast growing French presence in India was making company officials nervous. Suspecting that war against France in India was inevitable, the British began strengthening Fort William's defences in anticipation of an attack. However, the Nawab of Bengal resented this increased foreign military presence in his territory and demanded that the British governor of Calcutta stop work on the fortifications. When the British ignored his ultimatum, the Nawab marched on Calcutta with 50,000 men, intending to remove this foreign thorn from his side once and for all. With this massive Indian force fast approaching, the British governor and most company employees fled Calcutta, leaving the defence of Fort William in the hands of 170 British soldiers and their Indian allies, under the command of John Holwell a company bureaucrat who was more used to tax collection than military affairs. With no combat experience and inadequate supplies, the massively outnumbered British garrison was forced to surrender on June 20th, 1756. The survivors were disarmed and taken to Fort William's prison, where they were to be held overnight until more long-term arrangements could be made. However, the fort's jail cell had never been designed to hold such a large number of prisoners. Measuring just 18 feet long by 14 feet wide, the tiny cell was primarily built to house no more than a couple of men, and was usually used to confine rowdy, drunken soldiers for a few hours until they could sober up. As the British prisoners of war were herded into the tiny space, the cell quickly filled up. However, more and more men were forced in until the room was so tightly packed with bodies that the Indian guards are said to have struggled to close the door. With temperatures reaching as high as 40 degrees centigrade, the accompanying humidity quickly made such cramped conditions unbearable, and the sweating, compressed crowd inside began to suffocate. With just two tiny windows, the limited ventilation flowing into the room was further impeded by the window's thick iron bars, the meagre air that found its way in tainted by smoke from the fires still burning throughout the damaged fort. The stifling heat and lack of breathable air soon began to take its toll on the prisoners, and fights broke out as each soldier desperately struggled to position himself closer to the window. As the hours dragged on, more and more of their number died from suffocation and heat exhaustion. Those nearest the window begged the guards outside to intervene, only to be met with laughs and jeers from men who John Holwell would later say were full of resentment. Holwell believed that the guards were taking the revenge on the British by intentionally maximising the prisoners' suffering, depriving them of water and refusing to open the door, or even notify their officers of the deteriorating situation. Yet as more and more succumbed to suffocation and heat exhaustion, one guard took pity on the prisoners and passed them water through the window's iron bars. However, the now deranged and delirious men inside charged forward in an attempt to seize the water first, with dozens crushed and trampled to death in the ensuing stampede. In the brawl that followed, most of the precious water was spilt over the cell's dirty floor, and those lucky enough to drink even just a few drops complained that the water merely increased the raging thirst. The hell finally came to an end at 6am the next morning, however by the time the doors were unlocked, just 23 of the 146 prisoners were still alive. In a chilling testament to just how cramped conditions in the cell were, John Holwell noted that many of the corpses were still standing upright since there was no space for them to fall to the ground. Holwell was taken before the Nawab to protest the barbaric treatment the prisoners had suffered, but reported that the Bengal ruler showed no signs of regret or sympathy, merely offering him a glass of water. Yet this account of events has been the source of much controversy, 
with many suggesting that Holwell's figures were exaggerated for political purposes, and some historians believe that only 64 prisoners were sent to the hall, with 43 deaths. Regardless of the veracity of this account, what is certain was the British response. Back in London, the story was used to demonise the Indians and serve as justification for further British conquest of the Indian subcontinent, and a British army was quickly dispatched to retake Calcutta and overthrow the Nawab of Bengal. Vengeance was swift. Fort William fell to the British in January 1757, and in February the Nawab of Bengal was decisively defeated at the Battle of Plassey, a catastrophic loss which led to him being overthrown and executed by his own people, his body unceremoniously thrown into a nearby river. Number 1. The HMS Jersey A former British warship might not seem like a suitable candidate for one of the most feared dungeons in history. However, this floating dungeon was no less nightmarish, its thick oak timbers imprisoning thousands of Continental Army soldiers during the American Revolutionary War in conditions so dire that it became known as the HMS Hell, a seaborne chamber of torment that inflicted such immense suffering upon its thousands of guests that by the time the fighting ended, the HMS Jersey and other British prison ships like it had claimed more American lives than the war itself. One of the darkest but relatively unknown chapters of the American Revolutionary War occurred not upon one of its many battlefields, but in the waters of New York Harbor. By November 1776, British forces had completely occupied New York City and began using decommissioned warships anchored just off the coast to hold captured soldiers and sailors along with anyone else deemed to be a traitor and rebel. Even a simple refusal to swear an oath of allegiance to the British crown was considered enough of a crime to have you sent to one of these dozens of floating jails. The HMS Jersey was the largest and most notorious of these prison ships. Launched 40 years earlier, the Jersey initially served as a 60-gun warship of the Royal Navy, seeing action in the War of Jenkins Ear and the Seven Years' War before being converted to a hospital ship, and then finally a prison ship that would hold thousands of American rebels during the Revolutionary War, many of whom would never set foot on land again. The conditions American prisoners were subjected to on board were so appalling that the Jersey became a powerful symbol of British tyranny that helped rather than hindered the rebel cause. Although the ship was only designed for 400 sailors, 1,100 men were crammed together below decks with no natural light or fresh air. During summer, the men sweltered in the squalid atmosphere so many unwashed bodies produce when confined in close proximity the foul taint in the air making it difficult to simply breathe, while in winter men froze to death, with many of those who survived through to spring missing toes and fingers from severe cases of frostbite. Food rations were low quality and meager, this prolonged lack of nutrition weakening immune systems and leaving the prisoners vulnerable to contagious diseases that tore through the ship without mercy. Fed a diet primarily consisting of mouldy, worm-filled bread, what little meat the prisoners were provided with had been boiled in seawater collected from around the ship, seawater that had been contaminated by the human waste of thousands of men which congealed around the ship's hull. British guards enforced a strict regime of discipline, and punishments were handed out for the slightest infraction of the rules, and sometimes even for no good reason at all. News of British defeats during the war increased the frequency and severity of these punishments as the guards took out their frustrations on their American prisoners. Lacking even basic sanitation, the smell below decks was said to have been so thick and foul that candles would not light, the pestilent atmosphere a haven for rodents, lice and other vermin who tormented the prisoners day and night. Held indefinitely in such misery, most prisoners gave up hope of ever leaving the ship alive, with eyewitness accounts from survivors stating that an average of eight men died every day on the Jersey from disease, dehydration, and malnutrition. A feeling of stark hopelessness, coupled with the sheer boredom of their daily routine, drove many to madness, and the moans and screams of the sick and dying are said to have been audible from the nearby shores of Long Island, 
Yet even if they had the energy to do so, escape was all but impossible, the ever-watchful guards shooting anyone who attempted to swim away. American prisoners would remain on board the Jersey and other prison ships like it until the war ended in 1783, when she was abandoned and burnt by the retreating British, and the captives were finally freed. However, these floating dungeons had claimed a steep price in human lives. Conditions were so terrible that 11,000 American prisoners are thought to have died on board the Jersey and other British prison ships, which is almost three times the number of American soldiers killed in combat during the Revolutionary War, a grim statistic which illustrates the severity of the deprivations the men must have endured. So those are my choices for five of the worst dungeons in history. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll see you again on the next video.